the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Saints, family, friends, I'm so excited to be back. I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. I've been home resting and recuperating, but I'm so excited to be back in this position to share another portion of God's Word. Before we go any further, let me just publicly thank, I've already done it through text, but I want to publicly thank Brother Zach Allen, who led us in our Park and Praise in Pink in October. He did a wonderful job. I also want to thank Brother Reggie Osborne when he led us in our Youth Sunday last week. Two fine brothers did a phenomenal job. Again, thank you, brothers, for standing in the gap as I was home resting. This month, oh, I'm so pumped up. I'm so excited. This month, we are continuing with our series. Yep, we had to hit pause as I had to take a couple of weeks off, but we're back for the third week, the third installment of this series that we are calling Moments with the Master. I'm still just as excited, still just as pumped as I was for week one. I was even more excited for week two. This week, today, week three, I cannot contain my excitement. We still got some weeks to go, before we complete this series, but I'm so excited to give you all of these great lessons and these great uh, interactions and close encounters that folks had when they had their moment with the master. I haven't said it in a few weeks because I've been out, but you should know by now. Get your pen, get your paper, get your iPad, your cell phone, whatever you take your notes in. Gather everybody around the television, the computer, the TV, whatever, the phone, whatever you use to watch these services. You do not want to miss this third installment of Moments with the Master coming up very soon. Stay tuned. Good morning, Hillcrest. It is now time for our opening prayer. Let us go to, let's, let us go to the Heavenly Father in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, Humbly approach thy throne. We thank you for another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Grant you please forgive us of our sins. Grant you be with those that are sick and shut in. Grant you be with those families that are facing uncertainty during these uncertain times. Grant you be with those brothers and sisters that are in uniform that continue to confront racial and social injustice. Grant you be with our military. As they continue to secure America's borders, that you will protect them and keep your loving arms around each and every one of them. We ask you to be with our leadership, that you will keep them bound together in love and unified during this pandemic as they work tirelessly each and every week to provide these avenues of worship. We ask you to be with the body of Christ, that you will keep them encouraged, keep them strengthened also during this pandemic. We ask you to continue to be with Tori and Salary. As, as he prepares to bring forth the pure uncle gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you will give our fallen away family members space and time to return to the body of Christ before it's everlasting to them. 
We pray that all we do here on this morning will be pleasing in thine sight, and that you will continue to place a hedge of protection around each and every one of us and protect us from hurt, harm, and danger. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, church. I'll be reading John chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. The Bible says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? I've just read John chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is dead to prove my Savior to leave. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know, I know. Because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he Because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know. I want to thank all of these brothers that have led the service, the scripture reading, the prayer, the song leading. Thank you, brothers, as we are, again, trying to navigate through a virtual setting and these brothers doing their work from home and from the church. We appreciate your dedication. The scripture that was read this morning, John chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Let me just tack on a few more. I got to give you a little bit more of this scripture because this is another powerful story that I want to use today to dissect 
to break down so that we can process, we can gain an understanding of this person's moment with the master. So in the book of John, in the gospel of John, in the eighth chapter, I'm gonna read verses one through 11. You can follow along here on your screen. We'll put the scripture up for you. The Bible says, King James Version, the Bible says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all of the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. That's a lesson within itself. Verse 3 says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had sat her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Verse 6 says, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Oh, this is getting good. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down, Jesus we're talking about, and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one, none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are thou, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Verse 11, finally, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You know, in the, in the salary household, you know, I got to tell you stories about one of my children. In the salary household, TJ, y'all of you know, seen him on Facebook, seen him running around here in the church. <clears throat> TJ does something. Let me tell you the story. He does something in the house that he knows he should not have done. He knows he shouldn't be doing. But he gets into it anyways. Terrible twos. I already told you about that a few weeks ago. So he gets into things in the house. And when I hear something break or something being thrown like a ball in the house, I know it's TJ. First thing I do is I yell out his name. TJ, come here. And because TJ knows he is in trouble, I don't miss this story. Because he knows he is about to face his judgment, he begins to cry. Wherever he is, he's in the room, he's down the hallway, he begins to cry. And I can't hear him walking toward me. So I yell again, TJ, come here. And he begins to cry louder because he knows he is about to face some trouble. TJ, bring your butt here now. He begins to cry even louder to the point where I have to then instruct Kayla. Kayla, go upstairs and get your brother and bring him to me. So Kayla runs upstairs. She grabs him by the hand and literally almost has to drag him downstairs to face his judgment because of something he has done that he had no business doing. So as Kayla starts to drag him down the stairs and she brings him and sits him down right in front of me and he can see my face and he can see the anger and the disapproval and the disappointment that I might have in him, it begins to make him terrified. Oh, don't miss the story. And he begins to get fearful for his life because he knows at any moment the judge will render judgment for his actions. This poor sinful woman in our story today knew that fear just like TJ does. And as she was led into the presence of Jesus trembling, she knows in her heart that she is about to die a horrible death by stoning. First of all, can you just imagine 
being stoned to death. I know when you were kids and you were playing at the park or running home from school and you might have gotten in a fight with someone and they picked up a rock and they threw it at you and they may have missed but even if they hit you just one rock hitting you is enough pain to make you cry depending on where you got hit one rock can make you cry can you imagine being stoned to death can you imagine so many rocks being thrown and hitting you to the point where you die so as they are leading this woman into the presence and into the midst of Jesus I can't help but wonder she must be terrified however this moment that she had with the master oh it will soon change her life completely now I wanted to preach this sermon today because I want you to know that the same thing that Jesus did for this woman is the same thing that he can do for you and I you see she came into his presence a condemned sinner but she left his presence a changed woman in week one if you could recall back to week one when we first kicked this series off week one was titled a transforming moment and we dealt with the man with leprosy in week two we dealt with the title a tragic moment and we dealt with the rich young ruler you remember that well today for those that are taking notes I want to title this third installment a terrifying moment a terrifying moment when I hear the word terrifying to me that's a couple of degrees past scared that's a couple of degrees past fearful when you are terrified you are almost at the edge of death you are so shook you are so scared you are so fearful of what's about to happen that we call it terrified and so in this in this sermon called a terrifying moment I want to introduce you to this woman from our scriptures and I want to give you three things that she did oh don't miss it I want to unveil I want to reveal to you three things just within these 11 verses you know how it is by now I just want to take these verses and break them down so we can understand how this woman who committed adultery all within 11 verses had a moment with the master that changed her life forever three points the first one let's get into it let's get into it the first point is a condemned sinner a condemned sinner and we get that from verse 3 and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. So she was a condemned sinner. Now, let's look at this woman even more closely. Let's really dissect who this woman is, find out what her sin was, find out what her shame was, and find out what her sentence was. Oh, I got a couple of points I got to give you so that you can outline and break these points down. The first one, watch this. The first one is, let's look at her sin, all right? We're still under the, the point of a condemned sinner, but let's look at what exactly was her sin. Well, according to the story, she was caught in the very act of adultery. She was guilty before the face of the Lord. She was guilty before the world. She was a condemned sinner. She committed adultery. Now, adultery is, is a very bad sin. Don't miss it. Adultery is a very bad sin, but it's no worse than any other sin. Uh-oh, come on, help me out. Help me out with this one. According to James chapter 2, verse 10, it talks about how you can keep all of the laws in the land, but if you mess up on one, then you're guilty of them all. And so this woman that committed adultery was sinful of everything, all of the other sins that we can commit. And we heard that even growing up today. In your day and age, in my day, we hear that all the time, right? There is no sin greater than the other. The person that lies is just as guilty as the person that murders in God's eyes. There is no big sin and small sin. If you tell a white lie, it's the same as going out there to commit adultery. It's the same thing in God's eyes because it is a sin. And in fact, if we can be honest, right, if we can 
tell the truth and shame the devil, as they say, we are all in the same boat as this particular woman. We may not have gone out there and committed adultery. We may not have gone out there and cheated on our spouse or, or maybe uh, uh, had relations with another person's spouse. But even the lies that we commit on a daily basis is a sin that we're committing. And so this woman, her sin was the fact that she was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now watch this. Because of that sin, it led to her shame. I don't miss it. I'm trying to give you the outline. I'm trying to break down this whole, this whole set of verses for you. Because of her sin, it led to her shame. Watch this. What am I saying to you, Brother Salary? When you sin, oh, it leads to shame. Especially when you are caught in the very act, when you do it in the public, when everyone knows that you are a Christian and you sin, it leads to some shame. And this woman dealt with the same thing. Watch the story. In their haste, I'm talking about the Pharisees and the scribes. In their haste to bring this woman to the face of Jesus, her accusers, they probably didn't give her much time to even get properly dressed before she went out into the public. Hello, somebody, help me out. If they caught her in the very act of committing adultery, they probably weren't nice enough to say, well, go home and put on some clothes. Won't you go home and put on a robe, put on something to cover yourself up because we're about to take you to be stoned to death. If they caught her in the very act, they probably didn't give her that time. And so they probably rushed to get her to Jesus and she was shameful. Don't miss this. Caught in the very act, she was doing something she should have not been doing. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not making excuses for this woman at all, but she was already probably afraid knowing that she's on her way to see Jesus and then the very fact that she probably didn't have on any clothing led her to be shameful. Oh, don't miss this. Oh, don't miss it. Again, why is this important? We are no different than this woman. Maybe we have not committed adultery, but the sin that we commit on a daily basis leads to us being shameful. No matter how skillfully it is hidden from the eyes of man, no matter how good of a liar that we are, no matter how good at hiding things from people that we are, we can never hide anything from God. And when the day comes where we face God from our sins, it will lead to some shame. Oh, Brother Salary, what makes you say what you say? Well, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 3, it tells us that what's done in the dark will soon come to the light. And just like this woman, she sinned and her sin led to her shame. And watch this one. Now her shame is leading to her sentence. Oh, don't miss it. Her accusers, when they brought her to Jesus, they were absolutely correct. She should have been put to death for her act of committing adultery. That's according to the law. She should have been put to death. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10, Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 22. And so if that was the law and this woman knows the law and she committed adultery anyways and is being led to Jesus, she has to know that here comes my sentence. Here comes the judge handing down my sentence of stone her to death. Can you just imagine how terrifying that moment is. Can you just imagine that if you do something you're not supposed to do, you get caught publicly in the act, you're being led to face the music, as they say, and you see Jesus face to face. Can you imagine at that moment, it is the most terrifying thing you'll ever see? Not because you see the face of Jesus, watch this, but because you know that Jesus has the power to do what he wants with you and you were just caught in the act of sin. So this woman ha is having a terrifying moment, but, oh, here's the good news. Her moment with the master will soon change her life forever. You know, I always thought when I read the story, I always thought it was funny how in an effort to humiliate this woman, oh, don't miss it, in an effort to humiliate her, the Pharisees and the scribes took her to Jesus. <laughs> It, they took her to the one man that can overlook your past. Are y'all getting this? They took her to the one person that can overlook what you have done. They took her to the one person that has compassion for you. They took her to the one person that can, that can help change your life. So in an effort to humiliate her, they took her really to the wrong person. Oh, it was so funny when I read this. 
Don't miss how powerful they are. What do you mean, Brother Salary? Watch this. Can I just offer this statement to you? I wonder if you, I wonder if you'll agree with this statement. There are people praying on your downfall. I just gotta let that sit. That's a heavy statement. That is a heavy statement. Brother Salary, you're in my living room. Get out of here. There are people that are praying for your downfall. Do you realize how crazy that is? Think about that statement. There are people literally praying to God so that you will have a downfall. That's the same way these Pharisees and scribes did. They took this woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Yes, she sinned. Yes, she should be punished. But they took her to Jesus hoping that she would die. Can you understand how baffling, how confusing that statement is? And so since there are people that are praying for your downfall, there are people that are really praying to God to hurt you. Oh, but they don't realize that he'll help you. There are people praying to God to humiliate you, but they don't realize that he'll heal you. There are people that really pray to God to belittle you, but they don't realize that he'll build you up. There are people praying to God that he'll wipe you out, but they don't realize that he'll work with you. Oh, somebody help me out. There are people praying to God to embarrass you, but they don't realize he'll elevate you. There are people that are really out there praying to God to punish you, but they don't realize that that's the same God that will promote you. And so this woman is no different. And as you tune in this morning, as you tune in and watch this service, don't ever think that you have done something that is so shameful that he can't work with you. Don't you ever think that you are so far removed from the church that he can't pull you back in. Don't you ever think that you are so far out in the world of sin that God can't use you for his good. This woman was having a terrifying moment. Oh, but we're going to see here in a second that her moment with the master changed everything. And you know what I like about this? Is Jesus was known to hang out with sinners. Is that what your Bible says? Jesus was known to hang out with the sinner. Jesus was known to hang out with the very people that you and I would have overlooked. The same people that you and I would have passed over on the other side of the street to get away from, Jesus would have been over there sitting with them. The same people that you that you probably cuss out, let's be honest, let's be honest, church. The same people that you'll probably cuss out in a minute is the same folks that Jesus will work with. Them same people that you try to avoid eye contact so you don't got to talk to is the same folks that Jesus would have had a conversation with. So as they brought this woman to be stoned to death, they didn't realize Jesus was a compassionate Lord. And he wanted to work with this woman to make her life change forever. Why? Because Jesus isn't concerned about his reputation. Please don't miss it. Jesus isn't concerned with what you think about him. He isn't concerned with his reputation. He is more concerned with your soul. And so if that means folks can laugh and talk about Jesus, I honestly don't think he cares. I think he's more concerned with how can he use you for his purpose. So the first thing you got to understand about this story is that, yeah, she was a condemned sinner. But let me give you point number two. Because although she was a condemned sinner, that was the woman. Now let's talk about her accusers. Point number two is a cruel scheme. A cruel scheme scheme what do you mean brother salary these pharisees and these scribes they took out they, they planned a cruel scheme against jesus we read through verse 1 through 11 so quick you might have missed it but let me help you understand it there was a cruel scheme that they orchestrated or tried to orchestrate against jesus watch this let me tell you the plan that they put together but then let me tell you the problem that they ran into can i give you two quick points under a cruel scheme watch this here was their plan. These men, these accusers, they planned on attempting to force a dilemma on Jesus. Some of y'all are saying, I didn't read that in my Bible. You got to read verses 1 through 11. They were attempting to pull a plan, a cruel scheme against Jesus. Watch this. Here's how I know. If Jesus would have simply let the woman go, don't miss it. When they came to Jesus and said, this woman was caught in a very act, the law says this, what do you say, Jesus? Watch this, you got to understand the irony in that. If Jesus would have let the woman go, then he would have been seen as being easy or being soft. 
he would have been also probably arrested for violating the law because the law said when you get caught having a, or committing adultery then you need to be put to death via stone and they knew the law that's why they said hey the law says we got to put her to death by, by stones but what do you say Jesus and they was almost kind of leaning in waiting on him to trap himself waiting on him to incriminate himself but so 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 they wanted him to put her to death so if Jesus would have said she's good to go she's scot-free she's off the hook then he would have been seen as soft he would have been violating the law they had every right to arrest Jesus on the spot watch this but if Jesus would have said I give you permission to stone her to death and kill her then Jesus would have possibly destroyed his reputation as a friend of the publicans and sinners do y'all get the scheme that they're trying to put together on one hand they probably planned this they probably said if we get Jesus to let her go we can arrest him because he's violating the law oh but if we get Jesus to kill her then he's not the friend of publicans and sinners like he says he is and so they put together this cruel scheme but watch this no matter how you look at it they was they was messing with the wrong person they felt like we can trap jesus he has no wriggle room it's a lose lose situation for jesus but that was their plan that was their plan can i give you the problem that they ran into it's okay for their plan if that's what they're trying to do but then they ran into a problem and the problem was they were dealing with Jesus Christ. Oh, if that's not the heaviest statement you're going to hear today, that plan might have succeeded with you or not. That plan might have succeeded with an ordinary, regular Joe from down the street. But they tried to pull a scheme on Jesus. And they were dealing with Jesus, and he simply refused to play by their rules. When they tried to stump Jesus, they discovered that they had met their match. How do I know that, Brother Salary? Notice how Jesus responded to what they were trying to do. Jesus responded in two ways. First thing he did was he ignored them <laughs> and then he exposed them. Their plan was let's trap Jesus. The problem was this is Jesus. How did he respond? He ignored them and he exposed them. Where do you see that at, Brother Salary? In verse 6. The Bible talks about why they were talking to Jesus. He simply ignored them. He simply knelt down and with his finger he was writing something in the ground. And for years, Bible scholars all over the world have been trying to figure out what exactly did Jesus write in the ground. Here these folks are talking to him. Jesus is kneeling down, writing something in the sand with his hands. Everybody's been trying to figure it out. Well, here's the good news. No one knows what it is and no one will ever know what Jesus was writing down. Maybe, maybe Jesus was writing down the Ten Commandments. Because after all, it was his finger that wrote them the first time. Perhaps he was writing down Jeremiah 17, uh, verse number 13, where it talks about those that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Maybe he wrote down Leviticus 20 and 10 and Deuteronomy 22, 22, where it talked about the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death when they commit adultery. Maybe he simply wrote the word forgiven in the ground. Who knows what he wrote? You don't know, I don't know, we'll never know. But what I do know is whatever he wrote on the ground must have gotten their attention. Because, watch this, he still knows how to get our attention today. When we allow our hatred for other people to become public, Jesus has a way of getting our attention every single time. What does that mean, Brother Salary? Too many of us think that we are holier than thou. Too many of us think that we're better than other people just because we attend church, just because we wear the title of Christian, just because you give tithes in church, just because you feed the homeless. We have this I am holier than thou position and we begin to persecute others for not living up to the standards that we expect. But Jesus has a way of holding up a mirror in front of you to expose that you aren't the person you really think that you are. And so I love how in response to their plan, the first thing Jesus did was he ignored them. What else did he do, Brother Salary? In verses 7 through 9, he exposed them. Oh, this is the funny part right here. When Jesus finally did speak, because we're at the part in the story where he's kneeling down, he's writing something in the ground, they're still trying to talk to Jesus. When he finally did stand up from his knelt down position, his response was, let he that is without sin 
be the first one to cast the first stone. That's what his response is. Are y'all getting it? Whatever one, whichever one of y'all don't have any sin. I can hear Jesus saying it now. Whichever one of y'all don't have any sin, and you want this woman to be put to death, who, raise your hand. I'll wait. Who in here doesn't have any sin? Who in here is sin free? Who in here is sinless? Go ahead and raise your hand. I'll wait. And when your hand comes up, I give you permission to throw a stone at this woman. But he, stay, he sat, whoever has no sin, stand up, throw a stone. And he probably just sat there with his hands in his pocket. I can see Jesus now, just, just chilling. Who, which one of y'all don't have any sin? Let me, let me see your hand. And they probably just sat there looking around because all of them knew they had sin. Can you just imagine what was going on? You see, the cruel scheme that they designed was to accuse this woman and force Christ into killing her. But Christ responded with, let me expose you for who you are because you want to put to death a woman with sin, but you have sinned yourself. You may not have committed adultery, but you have sinned yourself. How do I know? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So don't think that you're holier than thou. Don't think because you went to church every Sunday for this whole year. Don't think because you gave like you're supposed to give. Don't think that you pray like you're supposed to pray. And when one person doesn't do that, we have every right in our mind to accuse them because Jesus will say, well, if you have no sin, you could be the first one to throw the stone. So as he mentioned this, they had no choice. These Pharisees, and scribes, they had no choice but to walk away quietly. I, I can hear them. I can hear them as they walked away. They probably dropped the stone. You could probably hear some sandals walking quietly on the dirt as they scurried out of the scene because Jesus ignored them and he exposed them. And for the woman, she probably still had a terrifying moment. But for the Pharisees and scribes, they probably had a truthful moment. What do I mean, Brother Saddle? When he exposed them, he revealed to them the truth, which is you are also a sinner. So you have no business trying to condemn someone else. Well, I got to hurry up. Time is escaping me. The first point was we, we, we met the woman. She was a condemned sinner. The second point was we met these Pharisees and scribes. They put together a cruel scheme. Watch the third point as we wrap it up. Now we're going to now we're going to focus on Jesus in the equation. The third point is a complete salvation, a complete salvation. Three things that Jesus did with this woman. Just in these couple of verses, there's three things that Jesus did with this woman and then we're going to wrap it up. First thing he did was Jesus faced her, Jesus forgave her, and Jesus freed her. Can I give you a little bit of information about each one? You got a few more minutes? All right, good. Watch this. The first thing he did, Jesus faced her. Now, we're at the point in the story, I already told you, we're at the point in the story where Jesus cleared the temple out, right? He shut it down. He said, if you got some sins, you don't got no business talking about this woman. Everybody left, they scurried out of the room. So he cleared out the temple and no one was there but Jesus and the woman. And so Jesus back up, he was kneeling down. He, he's back up in the standing position and he's facing the woman face to face. And at this point, she's probably still terrified. What makes you say that, Brother Salary? Because no one else in the room was qualified to stone her to death because everyone had sinned. But this woman was face to face with Jesus. Jesus was the only one that was sinless. Jesus was the only one that was sin free. And so she was probably still terrified because she hadn't escaped her death yet. Jesus was there and he had every right if he wanted to to put this woman to death because he had no sin. So as he stood up and faced this woman face to face, she was probably still very much terrified. So he faced her. What else did he do, Brother Salary? He forgave her. Oh, this is powerful. The only one that was qualified, I just told you this, the only one that was qualified to throw a stone refused to do so. So Jesus dealt with her on the basis of grace. All of the religious men condemned her. They already pretty much wrote her off and said she's good as dead. But Jesus saw someone worth saving. He saw someone worth salvaging. And in verse 10 and 11, he looked at her and said, where are all these guys that wanted to condemn you? Then he said, uh, she, she said, they're gone. He said, well, neither do I. So he forgave her. He faced her. He forgave her. Watch the third thing he did. 
he freed her. What are you saying, Brother Salary? She got a new lease on life. She got, a, she got a new chance. All of her life, she had probably been subject to Satan. She had probably been succumbed to all of the things, all the evil, all the sin that was around her. But she, 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 when she met Jesus in this moment with the master, all of the shackles were removed. And she was, she was no longer bound and she was set free from all of the sin that she was in. He told her, watch this. In the latter part of verse 11, Jesus told her, go and sin no more. She got her walking papers. She was discharged. She got a new lease on life. She was released. A once terrifying moment with the master became her transforming moment with the master. And as we're, as we're wrapping up, I'm almost done here. What's so amazing to me, many of us probably missed this. In verse 10, Jesus calls her woman. Oh, please don't miss this. As we're done, we're wrapping up. He calls her woman. Now, in the Gospel of John, the only other two times that he used the term woman was in chapter 2 and in chapter 19. Both times he used the word woman, it was used to describe his mother Mary. So the term woman was given to a woman worthy of honor. It was a term of honor. Now, this woman, because she committed adultery, many can argue that she was anything but a woman. But the very simple fact that Jesus saw something in her and called her woman, which is a title of honor, meant something to this particular woman. You know, I heard the song leader once say, he saw the best in me when everyone else around could only see the worst in me. And Jesus saw the potential in this woman. This is the same woman that was probably minutes before caught in the act of adultery. This is the same woman that all of the folks around wanted her to be put to get to death by stoning. This is the same woman who probably felt herself that her life didn't matter much. But in the moment with the master, he saw the best in her. When everyone else around could only focus on the worst part of her. You know, when Jesus, when Jesus looks at a lost sinner, he sees the potential that they have in their life. When the world writes you off, when the world says you're too far gone, when the world says you're not allowed to be around us, when the world says I'm disowning you, Jesus sees the best in you. And something that was once a terrifying moment can become your transforming moment when you have your moment with the master. Family life doesn't have to remain like it is for us. We can have a moment with the master today and every single day. Maybe like this woman, your life has been wrecked and ruined by sin. Maybe you have been hurt by religious people. Yeah, that's a real thing. Don't ever think just because you go to church with some church folks that these are the churchiest folks in the world. There are some, listen, there are some wolves in sheep clothing. There are some folks in the church that are out to hurt you. I hate to say it, but if you, you may have been hurt. You may have been a victim from a, a, a person in the church and it led you to think, I don't want to have anything to do with that church. Well, you need to have a moment with the master. You need to have a moment with the master. Maybe you're looking for a compassionate savior. I know one for you. Maybe you need someone that'll help you. I know somebody that can help you. Maybe you're looking for someone that can make everything right in your life. I got someone that you should meet. I got someone today that you should get in contact with. And I invite you to have a moment with that master. His name is Jesus. And he is the only one that can save you from whatever it is you're going through. I invite you to have your moment with the master today. Be set free from your bondage. Be set free from sin. Leave all that stuff in the world alone and come get your moment with the master today. The Bible says uh, there are certain things we have to do before we can call ourselves Christians. The Bible says we have to hear, hear the word of God. We have to believe that which we have heard. We have to repent of our sins. We have to confess the sweetest name known to man. We have to be baptized according to Acts 2.38. Church of Christ, we believe in baptism. That means you are fully submerged underwater. We don't believe in waiting for a special day. We don't, believe, we don't believe in waiting for a special Sunday. We don't believe in waiting until we get a large enough number of people interested. If you are ready to be baptized today, we will get you baptized today. Why? Look at the way the world is going. We are here today. We are gone tomorrow. 
Bible says our life is like a vapor. It, it, just, it just appears for a little bit of time and then it fades away. Why would you not want to have your moment with the master today? We've already talked about three people. The man with leprosy had a moment. It changed his life forever. The rich young ruler had a moment. It changed his life forever. This woman who committed adultery had a moment. It changed her life forever. What about you? You go through something every single day. You deal with stress every single day. You deal with things that are trying to take your life every single day. Why would you not want to have your moment with the master today? I want you to pick up your phone right now. I want you to call the number on your screen that you see in front of you. Select option number four or text that number that you see and send in your prayer request. One of our elders will pray with you, will pray for you so that you can have a moment with the master that you need. Whatever you stand in need of, make the call, send the text right now as we sing this beautiful song of invitation. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you. for collection. Generous giving is acknowledgement that everything we have is a gift from God. And Luke, the chapter 6, the verses 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God Almighty, thank you. Thank you for who you are, dear God knowing that you are the creator and we are your creation, we say thank you. Help us to use these funds that's in a manner that's well-pleasing to you. We're thankful for all the things that you give us because we know it come from you. Bless us, guide us, and direct us. For this is our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us remember that there's four options that you can give. Those four options are running across the screen at this time. So let us act accordingly. Remember that God loves you, and Hillcrest loves you too. Thank you. Oh, listen to our wonder story, count it once among the lost. Yeah, one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cost. Who saved us from eternal Who put God's Son upon the cross? this time, it is time for our communion. It is a great opportunity for us to dine with the Lord. And we find examples from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, 23rd verse, and ending at the 30th verse. And it reads, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whosoever eat this bread or drink of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So then let him eat of this bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh in judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many are asleep. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful that you've given us another golden opportunity to approach that throne of mercy and grace. Our Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to thee with our heads bowed and our hearts humble. Our Father God, we thank you for your wonderful son, Jesus. Our Father, we thank you for the bread that represents the broken body. And Father, we thank you for the cup that represents the shed blood. We pray, O oh merciful God, that you will be with those of us that take of this bread and this cup, that it, we will examine ourselves, Heavenly Father, to show our worthiness. This is our prayer we ask in that son's name. Amen. Let us now take of the bread. And you can now take of the cup. This concludes the Lord's Supper. My God is awesome, 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 awesome. My God is awesome, 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 awesome. My God is awesome. church say amen listen family and friends we hope we trust and we pray that you were truly blessed this morning as we delve into week number three moments with the master listen i want you to keep coming back every single sunday because we got more in store for you we've only barely scratched the surface so if you're looking to discover some more interactions and encounters with jesus come back every single sunday for your moment with the master and listen don't be selfish don't be selfish. Invite somebody with you. Send them the link. Tell them our Facebook page. Tell them how to find us on the web so that they too can have a moment with the master. Listen, I know you hear it every single day on the radio. You probably get many text messages sent to your phone like I do. But this coming election, I don't have to remind you. The, the, listen, the most important election of our lifetime. This coming Tuesday, I believe, if you have not done your early voting, if you haven't sent your ballot in, make sure you go get in line on Tuesday. I know they're going to be long. I know it's going to be de depressing to have to stand there all day and sad, but you cannot afford to miss this election. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, but you do have to exercise your right to be heard. Make sure you vote this Tuesday and take a friend with you to do the same thing. Come back next week. I'll see you next Sunday. Same place, same time. God loves you. Hillcrest loves you too. At this time, let us look to be dismissed. Let us please pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this hour and opportunity to worship you this morning. And thank you for Brother Salary and equipping him to preach your holy and inspired word. It's our hope and prayer, Lord, that the message preached this morning will reach into the depths of our souls so that we might walk more faithfully and acceptable in thy divine sight and in a manner that brings thy name glory and honor. Please be with us, Lord, as we dismiss from this virtual service, but not from thy holy presence. For it is in thy dear holy and mighty name we pray this prayer. Amen. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him 
over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the day go by. Oh, what a love between the Lord and I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the day go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I keep falling in love.